Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for tonight's live stream gallery talk from the College of St. Benedict. Tonight, the husband and wife team of literary artist Fred Amrim and visual artist Sandra Brick will be joining us from their home in Minneapolis, Minnesota to discuss the current exhibition called Lest We Forget on display at the Gretzky Gallery at the Benedicta Art Center through December 5th. I am Tanya Gertz, the Executive Director of Fine Arts Programming, and tonight I am stepping in for our delightful gallery manager, Jill Double D. Kuhn. I am also tonight so honored to be joined by our first student cohort, Teresa Wentworth. Teresa is a College of St. Benedict senior, majoring in communications, and has been a valued gallery assistant for almost four years. After the presentation tonight, Teresa will be hosting the Q&A portion with her artists. She has some of her own questions that she's anxious and excited to be able to ask our artists. But you are also able to ask questions in the chat that's on the right side, and we'll be able to share them with Teresa to ask on your behalf. I am so very thankful for the opportunity to host Lest We Forget in our galleries and this evening. It is an incredibly timely exhibition addressing anti-Semitism and discrimination and the personal experience of it all. There are lessons for all of us from the experience of the Holocaust today. Specifically, this exhibition contains 24 works of art in fabric and collage created by Sandra Brick in response to short vignettes that were written by Fred Amrin, who was reflecting on his coming of age as a young Jewish boy, first in Holocaust Germany, and then as a refugee in the United States. I want to tell you just a bit about Sandra and Fred's backgrounds. Sandra is a fiber artist. Her work is part of the Minneapolis Institute of Art Collection and can be seen at fine art galleries and shops. She has taught workshops and exhibited on three continents. And currently, Sandra teaches workshops and classes at the Textile Center for the Arts, located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She has received a degree in design from the University of Minnesota. Fred is a retired award-winning professor, an inventor, a sought-after public speaker, and storyteller. He has authored five books, multiple book chapters, and dozens of essays, articles, and stories. His most recent memoir is We're in America Now, A Survivor's Story. He is a Morse alumni distinguished professor emeritus of creativity and communication from the University of Minnesota. Now, I hope that there are a several wonderful students joining us this evening on the stream. Before Sandra and Fred share with us more about tonight's exhibition, the art, and their creative process, I want to share with all the students attending how you can fulfill your part of your FAE Fine Arts Experience requirement. For this evening, during the presentation, you will see a code that appears on the screen for about five minutes at some time during the presentation. During the time when you see it, please click on the link in the video description below and fill out the form that comes up. You have five minutes of the code being displayed to be able to enter the code to receive your credit. If you have any issues, you can just contact us directly and we'll be glad to help you. And now it is my great honor to welcome our featured artists, Fred Amron and Sandra Brick to talk about this incredibly poignant and wonderful gallery exhibit, Lest We Forget. Well, Tanya, thank you very, very, very much for, uh, for that fine introduction. I hope we can live up to it. Uh, thank you also to Jill, who took the risk and let us bring our exhibition to the College of St. Ben. And uh, you'll later meet Teresa, and we want to thank her in advance for her questions. 
Um, opera is a combination of music and words. Well, we created a combination of words and the visual art, our own form of opera. Sandra and I created a collaboration. Most of the collaboration happened this way. Um, I wrote some stories about my life. Uh, many of them were published. They would range anywhere from 5 to 15 pages or even longer. Uh, Sandra then took out what she considered to be the essence of the story, and she created a work of art. And then she said, now you have to write your story that might have been uh, up to 15 pages. You have to create that in 275 words so that it fits on a panel. So she had the challenge, challenge of making the art, and then I had the challenge of writing something that was really short. Uh, many of you who have tried writing know that writing a long piece is a whole lot easier than writing short. We've combined, uh, we've combined uh, the verbal art and the visual art, as as I've suggested. Um, and here is the first here is the first piece that uh, we want to talk about. Uh, it's really a link uh, to uh, a bridge, perhaps, to the Christian community, because there were a lot of upstanders in Germany who were not Jewish, who saved a lot of Jewish lives. Um, oh, um, let me read to you just a wee bit from, from the introductory story. Uh, if I can find it here, I, here we go. I was born in a Christian infant's shelter my birth certificate was the signature of a nun. Her title is clear, Oberin, Mother Superior. And just think of that, folks. Uh, uh, my birth certificate is actually signed by a Mother Superior. Just seven and a half months after Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, that was the 30th of January, 1933, the Nazis had already prohibited Jews from using public hospitals. Our Jewish hospital was closed. Juden verboten, Jews forbidden. Some Christian agencies stood up to Hitler. My, my mother superior allowed Jewish women to use her facilities and encouraged her nurses to be daring. They, they took a risk on my behalf. Besides the nuns who assured my, happy, my healthy birth, I've written about other Christians who supported uh, Jews during the Holocaust. Now, Sandra, talk a little bit about the art that you created from my story. So how do you convey the, the heaviness of a Jewish family having to go to a Christian organization um, to have their child born. So I decided to use a copy of the birth certificate itself. Not only does it show the signature of the mother superior, it has the stamp on it of the Nazi party. So all certificates and documents were stamped. So can you imagine being a Jew who's being um, ostracized by the Nazis having that stamp on your firstborn child's birth certificate. Also, I added a Star of David, which I embroidered to resemble those that the Jews had to wear in Germany and other parts of Europe. And you'll notice if you go see the show or you see the virtual part of the show, that yellow is used in almost all the pieces. I use the color yellow because of the star as a bridge or a connection between the pieces. So, so what are we asking you to not forget? 
Um, we're asking you to not forget the Holocaust. We're not. We're asking you to not forget the six million who died during the Holocaust, but not just the ones, the people who died, but the millions in addition who became refugees, who became dis displaced persons like me. Um, and more important for you, the young people, we want you to remember all genocides. Genocides all the way back, say, to the Crus Crusades and up to the present. There are genocides going on in the world right now as we speak. Uh, before we step to the next slide, uh, yes, that's a picture of me and my mommy, and uh, you probably would recognize me if you met me now. <laughs> One of the ways that we're trying to help you visualize and internalize the, the effects of a genocide, the effects of the six million is through personal stories. And one of the stories that we'll talk about now is... Nua Fuyudin. Um, mommy took me to the park regularly, uh, several times a week. Park was just a few blocks from our apartment. As soon as we stepped into Goetheplatz, that was the name of our park, I ran ahead to my favorite bench, hidden in an alcove surrounded by tall trees. It was a shady spot, and lots of birds lived in the trees. Mommy sometimes pointed to the nests, identifying types of birds. I gave them individual names, like Gretchen or Hanalora, the birds whistled songs and Mommy whistled back at them. I think they liked Mommy's whistles. Suddenly, Mommy's eyes darted around nervously. We have to go now. Why? We just arrived. I want to play with the birds. We must go now. Mommy was looking past my head, so I turned around to see some letters printed on the top board of the bench words that, had, that I had not seen before. I sounded out the short words printed on the bench. Nur für Juden, I said slowly. Then I put the words together in a sentence. Only for Jews. A week later, all the other benches had, print, had words printed on them. Nur für Aria, only for Aryans. Now, relatively speaking, those were the good days. Those were the days when one bench was assigned to the Jews. A year later, none of the benches were assigned to the Jews. The Jews couldn't use the park anymore. And a year after that, um, Jews were being hauled off to the concentration camps. And one of the lessons we'd hope for you to learn is that genocide starts small and then with small acts of discrimination grows and grows and then we have the atrocities. So, so the question is how do you convey that heaviness visually? Um, and there's historical elements. How true to the historical elements do you have to be? And what is the visual interpretation? And just like a memoir is not a a biography or an autobiography, there's some elaboration that happens and in a visual interpretation or a visual memoir, there's also elaboration. But in this case, I was able to find free online the exact font that the Nazis used on most of their signs through Germany and Europe. And I was able to get small vinyl letters that I ma had made to put on the bench that I made but also to convey the delight of the park and what was being lost, I put a bird on the bench. The tree was sewn down with hand-dyed silk rib ribbon that I bought, because that I made, excuse me, I dyed, I hand-dyed the silk rhythm, ribbon and put it down so that I could convey Fred's delight with the tree. But Fred's delight with the park was starting to get gloomy and the 
not as wonderful as he had first remembered. So I used two layers of handmade paper so that the grayness could come through the green and show how slowly but surely the Nazis were eating away at his happiness. Another story is the story of the Gestapo coming to our house. Things were getting worse and worse, and that's how, as I said, how genocides develop. They don't just start with atrocities. Gestapo came to our apartment regularly. They were often looking for my father, who had gone missing. They were looking for other things. One day, knock, 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 and they came in looking for radios, and they finally found our one radio. In the process, they pulled out their pistols. They made my mother and, and me stand in the corner, and I would hide behind my mother's skirt and hold on to that skirt. On one occasion that I write about here, three officers entered our apartment, all in calf high, leather, shiny leather boots, and all carrying drawn pistols. Gestapo, announced the late lead officer in his intimidating black uniform. His visor cap displayed an eagle and a death mask, or was it a skull? On his left arm, he wore a red band emblazoned with a swastika. Pointing with his gun, he told my mother and me to stand in a corner. The other two officers holstered their guns and started searching my favorite room, the space where Papa stored the textiles he sold. Perfectly white walls with perfectly white shelves showed all bolts of fabric in every imaginable color and texture. I love the colors from pastel pink to glowing red, from aqua to royal blue, from lemon yellow to grass green. I love Papa's fabric room better than going to the park, even better than eating ice cream. The colors made my heart beat faster. When the officers had finished hauling away the last bolt of fabric, they looked at my mother, clicked their heels, gave a small bow, and in unison shouted, A Heil Hitler. Mommy locked the front door, and we went into Papa's storage room. The glass chandelier made the white walls even whiter. All white. No color anywhere. We both cried. That was my last day of crying for many years. Shortly thereafter, uh, the Gestapo found my father and took him to slave labor. So the next time the men in uniform returned with their terrifying knock, I unlocked the door myself. This time I stood in front of my mother, not behind. I looked straight at the lead officer with my arms crossed. I guess that was the proper posture for a grown-up. So this is a detail of the piece with Fred and his mother behind the Gestapo. They felt small and insignificant. And I actually, um, Fred's mother, and we're not quite sure how she did it, but was able to bring quite a few pictures from Germany to the United States when they came here as refugees. And I actually out traced the outline of one of the photos and stitched that. Part of creating a work of art, just like writing, is a process of drafting. Sometimes you do things that don't work. So the, the image on the left is what I did first. I outlined it, the figures in a brown thread which after I had done it seemed to be almost insignificant. You could not really see the characters and they faded in the background. And I wanted them to have a presence even though they did not feel they had a presence. Another thing that we dealt with was memory versus reality. 
So this show is really about, as well as the book, Fred's memories. And we all know that sometimes memory and reality aren't the same. For over a year, my mother and I collected fabrics that were either actually produced in the 1930s or were reproductions of prints from the 1930s. And I laid out the draft of the, the piece and Fred said, no, I don't remember any prints. I just remember solid, pure, bright colors. Now, anybody who's had the pleasure of going into a um, fabric store knows that that's not what you see. You never see just plain colors. But this is Fred's story. And this was a true collaboration. And so he only remembered prints. I mean, solid colors. So I did only solid colors. I hand dyed a whole bunch of fabric and wrapped it around pieces of wood to represent bolts of fabric. And this is the final piece. And you'll notice there's a one bolt of yellow, again, to represent the Jews. And it's down below because at this point of the story, the Jews placed in not in German society has been moving down lower and lower and lower. Another story is the story of Kristallnacht. Today is the 5th of November. On the 9th of November in 1938, we in Germany experienced Kristallnacht, Crystal Night, the Night of Broken Glass. Uh, in four days, we will have the 86th anniversary of that day. Any Jew living in Nazi Germany on November 9th, 1938, remembers Kristallnacht, the night of shattered glass. From our balcony, I watched our local synagogue burning. And here you see uh, our local synagogue. Uh, it's the synagogue where I worshipped when I was a boy. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful building. It was completed in 1860, uh, and, and even until 1938, when I saw it last, uh, it was just awesome. The, the community was built around it. I watched our local synagogue burning. I watched strangers kick Jews easily identified because they were required to wear the Star of David that Sandra spoke about. I watched police officers use their nightsticks to shatter windows of shops owned by Jews. Kristallnacht is the night when a thousand synagogues were burned on one night in Germany and Austria. 10,000 businesses were looted and destroyed. Jews were hauled into the streets and beaten. It was probably the turning point uh, in, um, in the Holocaust. After this, the atrocities became serious. Up until now, we find the kinds of stories that I've told about where we couldn't use a bench, we couldn't use the school, we couldn't go to the, pub, to the Jewish hospital. So... I, you'll notice if you look very closely at the slide that there's glass over it. And even though this, this is a heavy story and this is a hard subject, um, sometimes making art is fun. I was able to purchase a blowtorch, a small blowtorch. And I found out from a friend that when you heat glass, it becomes liquid and you're able to break it where you want it more or less. So I got to play with fire and break glass in order to make this piece. Another thing about art is that sometimes you make a piece and you decide that you didn't really like it. And you make a list mentally of all the things you'd like to correct if you ever had an opportunity. The artwork on the left is the original piece that I made for this exhibit, which I was fortunate enough to sell out east um, when the show was in Massachusetts. And there were things that I didn't feel comfortable about it. So then when I redid it, I tried to correct those things. And I think 
in hindsight, the first piece is more powerful. Um, and one of the reasons that I think it's more powerful is that I think it's a sadder looking piece. And the night of broken glass is really a sad time. It was a sad event. It was a turning point in a war um, that really um, led to the six million. But, and then six million is a hard number to imagine. And we're hoping that by shedding light on one family, by showing how it affect one family, that the six million becomes more real. I'm an only child. It was customary for young Ger German Jewish adults during the Holocaust to have only one child, often none at all. Why bring more Jewish children into a world like this, my, my mother would often ask. Why indeed? My mother's youngest sister, Kate, mommy called her the baby, moved to Amsterdam and married a Dutch man, Isaac Wumps, their only child, my only first cousin, Altje, was born in Holland on August 21st, 1939, when Holland still seemed like a safe country for Jews. What can I tell you about Altje Wumps? All I remember is that she was small, an infant, when I saw her last. I can only imagine her life story, what might have been. Might she have become a president, a prime minister, a Supreme Court judge, a Nobel laureate scientist? Or might she have become a housewife, caring for her own children and grandchildren? She might have grown up old, just as I did. She might have grown old with me, just six years my junior. The Nazis invaded Holland on May 10th, 1940. We don't know the details of the family's suffering. Years later, however, while studying rec records at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, we learned that on February 19, 1943, Alcha, with her 29-year-old mother, died in this Auschwitz gas chamber. The Nazi killers had kept scrupulous documents in a clear script. Alch's age at the time of the murder, three and a half. Imagine Alch forced into a gas chamber and then pushed further into the crematorium and all that was left was ashes and smoke. Parents gone, uncles and aunts gone, cousin Alcha gone, I am an only child, and all I have left is a photograph of a child who did not survive the Holocaust. Now, six million, as Sandra said, is a number that is hard to imagine. Alcha was one of the six million, and I could list oodles more, dozens more of my relatives who went into one death camp or another, who were murdered, who were starved. Those are all individual stories that add up to six million. And this particular piece, I added the yellow as an outline around Alcha because Jews, after a certain point during the war, felt like they were walking around blazing yellow and people knew that they were Jews. But one of the missions of this exhibit and Fred's book and us here um, having a conversation with you is that we're trying to encourage people to be upstanders versus bystanders. We truly want to make never again a reality and that includes not only on the big front of genocides that are help, happening to large populations around the world, like the Uyghurs, but it's also within our communities, the racism and the violence that's happening, the bullying that's happening. 
We want people to be upstanders and to realize the worth and value of everybody. Genocide won't stop without you. You're the ones who can make never again happen. And this particular picture, when Fred came to the United States, became a citizen and was a fully functioning United States citizen, still felt like he had Jew written on his forehead because of the bullying. And so the exhibit is called Less We Forget because there are things that we want you to remember. And this particular piece um, was the last piece of the, is the last piece of the show. And it is one of the pieces that I brought to Fred and had Fred write a story. I also owe my father thanks for helping me with my artwork. I had the idea for the base where the artwork sits and my father is a woodworker and in his retirement that became his avocation. And so I would go visit my dad and I would be his helper while we produced the bases. And during one of my trips, he brought out a router to help with one of the other pieces. And I asked very innocently, can you cut a hole right through the wood base? He said, sure, no problem. And so he cut the hole. And this piece in particular was inspired by the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. In that museum, there's a room that has photographs that were produced um, that represent a whole town that was wiped out by the Nazis. When the um, allies came in and realized that the whole town was de de decimated, they found in the photographer's studio, the negatives, and the photographer had taken pictures of pretty much everybody in town. So they printed those negatives. And so there's a whole room at the Holocaust Museum full of pictures where nobody, nobody has any relatives left to remember them. And Ashkenazi Jews put a stone on the headstone at a cemetery when they go visit an ancestor's grave. And there are multiple, there are millions of people who don't have anybody to remember them, have nobody to write their story or produce art about them, or even to have their pictures hanging on the wall. And we wanted people to realize the, the sadness of it all. And the stone is from Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. So Sandra then said that when she held up this empty frame and held up in the other hand the stone, she said, I'll make this art. You write a story. And I said, no, it can't be done. And she said, you will. And being an obedient husband, I did. And this is what I wrote. I want to tell a story about my Oma Yetchen, my grandma, Papa's mother. I was a young boy when I saw her last. Last, I sat on her lap when she read Rot Rotkäppchen and Rumpelstiltskin and let me turn the pages of her books. She was murdered by the Nazis in the Riga ghetto. I grew up without my Oma. As a survivor, I can tell my life story. I can write a memoir. Oma Yetchen didn't survive. I have no Oma story. I can't paint an Oma portrait, just an empty frame. My friend, Alice Musabende witnessed the genocide in Rwanda. One day she arrived home from an errand to find the dead bodies of her grandparents, her mother and father, her 12-year-old sister, and her nine-year-old and two-year-old brothers. Alice was 14. Alice survived and grew up to be a successful adult. Like me, she writes about her life and her assimilation into a new culture. But her siblings have no story to tell. Her parents can't boast about their children or Alice's wedding or the day their first baby was born. Just empty frames. 
How many families, mother, father, children, walked into the Auschwitz gas chamber? Only the smoke from the crematoria chimneys can tell how many whole families died with not a single survivor. Dead children have no story to tell. Dead parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts. Millions of frames forever empty. Jews leave a stone when visiting a grave. I don't know where to leave my stone for Uncle Jacob or Uncle Carol or Cousin Aitya. Can I leave a stone in an empty frame? Here's a cover to my memoir. What, what you see in the exhibition are panels that contain many, many stories, 275 words on average. Uh, there are more stories that are in the memoir. Um, the stories are longer uh, and, uh, and more detailed, and there are different aspects as well. Um, We're in America now. is available at uh, bookstores and online. Uh, Sandra also sells prints of her images. They're high quality prints. She's, after learning the lesson that she talked about when she sold the piece of the Kristallnacht, she no longer sells the original art from this exhibition. But you can buy uh, prints, reprints of the art. If you want to get in touch with us, um, go to www.lestweforgetexhibit.org. The O-R-G is really important. There's a, there's a connect thing. Hmm? There's a contact page. There's a contact page, and you can write to Sandra or to me. Uh, we promise to respond uh, with your questions, if you have applause, whatever else you want to say. Uh, we're going to stop now and uh, um, and answer questions that you may have. Hello? Oh, Fred and Sandra, this was incredible. I, um, I really do think I could listen to you tell your stories and talk about the way that you have captured the like poignancy of it all and the detail of your art, Sandra. It's really, really an incredible thing. Um, I am gonna find myself looking around my house, noting all of the frames and giving gratitude mm -hmm. that I have photos and family that I am connected to share life with and share story with. Thank you for tonight so much. I'm sappy, I'm sorry, it was really moving and I am very grateful to you. So um, thank you. And I um, now transition here to Teresa again. Teresa, one of our star students working with the Fine Arts Gallery who has helped to create our gallery exhibits for four years and the host our artists and Teresa as our student co-host is going to ask the official first question. Okay, the first question is for Sandra. Um, in the textile panel at the gallery, it says that can a picture really capture a thousand words? Um, does your visual art carry the same pieces as Fred's? Like, how is your process to that? So I'm going to start with answering the concept of the show. The concept of the show was to have you walk into a book. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when there's art and words, one takes over the other. And my goal was for them to be companions, just like Fred and I are companions and work together. I wanted the words to be, sorry, we um, had an alarm going, sorry about that. I, we wanted we wanted the words and the visuals to work together to be true companion, and so I wanted them to be powerful together, and so that was the goal 
to arrange the show as a book. So you walk through and you either see first or read or read first and see, and then see how they relate together. And that's was the goal. It wasn't for me to pick up the story and make a powerful piece. It was for us to work together. And then a question we have on the questionnaire was for how long have you been telling people the story and creating the art around it? So I think the first show was in 2008. Um, oh, it's, it started out with nine pieces and then went to 12 and then went to 20 and now is stopping at 24. So it, it, was, it wasn't a full blown 40 hours a week since 2008. Um, a lot of times the way I work is to percolate so I would read a story, I would have to let it percolate, I would make sketches, we would have discussion, I would make changes. So sometimes a piece could just stay for a couple months, even a year before it happened. Um, this could be a question for both you or Fred, but do you see similarities or connections with what's happening in today's society with your show? I suggested during my talk that genocides begin slowly. Um, I um, I wouldn't suggest that what I see in the 2020 world in the U.S. Um, is anything like Nazi Germany, not even close. However, the kinds of things that happened in the early 1930s scare the hell out of me because I feel as if I'm home again. Uh, there are things happening now, and this, this may trigger some political backlash, uh, backlash <laughs> and, um, and I try to, to in, in these talks, to, to be as neutral as possible, but so long as you ask the question, Teresa. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm scared as hell. Um, and uh, I sure hope that we get through this election peacefully uh, and that we make whatever transition needs to be made peacefully and that we can turn things around. Yeah, you said you were um, very worried. Um, and you are one of the few survivors left. How do you, um, is that worry that we could forget what happened? It's about being Muslim. Oh, yeah, say, say what? When Muslims, when you had to register. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm concerned that there won't be any people to remember. Uh, and that's part of the lest we forget concept. That is, I'm counting on you um, and your generation, or I would say Tanya's generation, and she's a lot younger than I am, uh, and your, Teresa, your generation, to remember and to act and to be an upstander. Um, let me give you uh, one example. Um, early on, uh, oh, I, in, the, in the current presidency, uh, it was still in the first year. There was some talk of making Muslims register, which is, of course, how it started in the 1930s with the Jews, uh, that all Muslims would have to register. Now, that didn't come about. But when we read about it in the newspaper, Sandra said, oh, I'll register tomorrow. And... I agreed, let's register together. And if we all register as Muslims, then by golly, you can't do anything bad to the Muslims because we're all Muslims. And something like that happened in Denmark uh, during the 19th, late 1930s with the Jews where lots of people suddenly became Jews and, and and if the, Germ if the German people had be been upstanders, if they had said, we're concerned about this, we don't want 
We don't like the direction of the country. We don't want to let this happen. If they had taken action, there would have been no genocide. There probably would have been no World War II. But nobody cared. People were bystanders instead of upstanders. People just kind of stood by. Um, but yes, take action. Um, Sandra, in your artwork um, is being more abstract with um, nature, with dyeing and embellishing of textiles. Can you explain your process of approaching the creative um, process in creating the series? Well, that's a good. <laughs> <laughs> I likes your question. Yeah. Um, so I view art making as creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was my idea to do this show together because I really enjoy working with Fred. And so this was one way that we would work together. And um, in the process of reading his short, his, his book as he was doing it, being one of the proofers, I developed images in my head and many of the pieces in the show, if you compare the story to what's in the book, you'll find out that the 275 words are actually 45 pages. So I would pull the images that I liked from the story that I wanted in my piece. And I would say, okay, now can you make this a short story? Can you make this work? Because I was going for the impact. How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you show what you're saying to have the most impact? And so multiple times he would go, you know, that's a hundred pages, you know. And he would he would he would write three hundred words, and I'd say, you know, that doesn't fit on the panel. And he'd say, well, maybe you need to take an element out of the image. You know, so it was a really, it was a back and forth and it was a problem solving, but the, the whole goal was to be as impactful with the stories as possible. And the, the show could easily be 40 or 50 pieces, but we had to pick and choose. And so that was also part of the process, which stories were important to convey what we wanted to convey. I also noticed in some of your, um, pictures that the sewed figures represented in the exhibit speak to people in Fred's narrative in each panel. Can you speak to the styling of these figures and to why they have no faces? Because I wanted them to be anybody's person. Mm -hmm. um, I, wanted, I wanted you to be able to put yourself there and and I keep harking back to the fact that as a child, I was a voracious reader and I read every single Nancy Drew book that I could get my hands on. And then when I was, I don't know, maybe in ninth or 10th grade, there was a TV show, Nancy Drew, which only lasted one season, but Nancy Drew character was not who I saw in my head. Like I could not watch that show because that was not the Nancy Drew. I couldn't put myself there. And that feeling has stayed with me. And part of wanting to get people to call for action is I wanted them to feel that they could be there, that that was them or their family also. Let me, let me add something to, to Sandra's um, answer. Uh, Sandra does a lot of art that's not related to the Holocaust at all, or to me. Um, and s many of her pieces include mirrors, um, which captures that same concept, <coughs> so that when there is this art that you're looking at, and somewhere there's a mirror, and you see yourself, and you're the person who's responsible, you're the person who's in the picture. I had never made that connection. Very nice. Well, that's why I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> that's powerful. In the comment section, it says you mentioned registering as a Muslim as a way of creating a sense of togetherness and community. Are there other ways that you would recommend for people to do this on a small scale? Um, 
And to, to be brief, because I could, I could give you a list of things that need to be done, but if you uh, if you go to uh, the website of World Without Genocide, it's www. I think World Without Genocide. Um, go to that website, and there are pages of things that need doing today. There are pages of issues that are, are happening. Sign up for their newsletter that comes out periodically. Um, and it's a very good newsletter in which I occasionally write articles, which make it, of course, even better. Uh, um, but go to that website, World Without Genocide, and there are just oodles of things to do that need doing. There's a but, but look around you. You know what? Look around you. What needs doing? Who's being bullied today? Because the bullying in the playground just grows up to be genocide if you don't stop it. Right. And there's a link to World Without Genocide on the Less We Forget website. But just like people think their vote doesn't count, and we're seeing over and over again, especially this election, how important that one vote is. Your one action is really important. So if you're at a movie theater and someone isn't getting any attention because they're a person of color or they're not dressed like the rest of the people, you be the one to give them the attention. You know, if you see, we have to stop making judgments about people based on how they're dressed. I um, often, I help at a food distribution once a month at 800 West Broadway. And there are people who come that are dressed up and you can't assume that they're just, you know, doing this because it's free food. They really need it. The people who come are there to be treated with dignity and not to be judged. And we have to start treating people with dignity. And I think the final question I have is what is the biggest takeaway you and Fred would like viewers to experience from this exhibit and tonight's presentation? I think there are two two takeaways. One is to not forget the, the the takeaway that we've talked about again and again that um, genocides are horrific and we need to prevent them and we need to bring greater justice. The other takeaway is for folks to appreciate art, uh, art whether it's visual art or if it's literary art, uh, writing that's done well, or if it's music or dance or whatever, that is to begin to appreciate art and the role that art can play in the world, uh, how art can talk about genocide. I have an additional takeaway. I think that we all have stories and our families have stories. And so one of the problems with when Fred was starting to write was everybody he could verify stuff with were dead because he didn't become interested in it until later in life. And so, you know, your grandmother might look like an old, uninteresting woman, but I bet when she was 12 or 13 or 20, she had great adventures. And so now is the time to get those stories and to learn about your own history and to capture them, write them down, record them, do art about them, but show an interest in your story and learn where you came from and what your story is. That is a, uh, was such incredible takeaways. I had one more takeaway question, but I don't, it feels like I'm compromising such a powerful several comments. But I think about we have so many young students who are artists. And if there are artists who are feeling called young artists, who are feeling called to incorporate art around the experiences of the world or their own stories or something that's hard, what advice would you offer to them? To just do it. Just do it. The Textile Center of Minnesota has a um, a series of exhibits around the Twin Cities that um, deal with hear our voice 
and about the violence and the injustice. And many of those shows are um, virtual, but they're just people making quilts that speak to their experience, to speak to their interpretation of the experience, to think about to that address their feelings. Um, art is a really good way to process feelings and and not to worry about it being viewed as art by others or as good or as it does it accomplish the task because you do art first for yourself and the the process of doing art is scary because it's like standing naked out in the world because there is your baby there you are but you just have to be brave and you do it and the more you do it the better you get at it and the more wonderful it is um i i really hate to bring this to a close because you two are wise and inspiring and clearly kind and compassionate towards other people in the world. And I really do hope that there are artists that are hearing you that um, create in ways they didn't before and that every one of us asks for more stories and that we might choose to be upstanders a whole lot more often without anyone needing to endorse us to do it but that we can just do it when we know it is to be done. You two are a powerful story together. The vision of both storytelling and percolating and collaborating in the midst of what you create that has such heart and like genuine history that matters for all of us to experience. I really, really valued your presentation tonight. And I am so glad that we were honored enough to have you in our gallery and to have you here um, to be able to share this. And uh, I look forward when I can meet you in person. Thank you very much. Thank you for the yeah. opportunity. Thank you. Uh -huh. So, oh, well, for everyone tonight, we are so glad for Sandra and for Fred and for Teresa. And I want to thank you so much for spending your time with us. Um, I just want to remind all of you that Lest We Forget is still in our gallery at the Gretzky Gallery at the Benedict Art Center at the College of St. Benedict. It will be up until December 5th. And the gallery exhibit is open from Wednesday through Saturday from 11 to 9. Each gallery does have a limit of 10 visitors at a time. Everyone wear your masks and social distance, but you can experience the art in person if you would like to do that. In addition, this exhibition is available, this video tonight will continue to be available. You'll be able to view it again if you would like to. And online, you can see a really beautiful self-guided Visio Divina experience with this artwork. And we extend a huge thanks and gratitude to Professor Betsy Johnson for her work to create that on this exhibit for all of us. It is yet another way to be able to experience the personal nature of this exhibit yourself. There's also a chance still to be able to experience pieces of me at the St. John's campus and the art gallery there. This is the exhibit from Melissa Coke Benson, these stunning large graphite images that look like photographs, but are personal creations. They are striking and we hope that you might be able to see them in person as well, or at least be able to also see her um, gallery talk that is also still available. I offer a final huge, tremendous thank you to Fred and Sandra. May we all live with the heart and the vision that you have had. And may for all of us, we claim our stories, we ask the stories of others, and we live with enough vulnerability to claim them. Good night. Stay well, everybody. <laughs>